Church. Special welcome to those who are watching at home. We appreciate you taking some time this morning to uh, come together wherever we are, that we can celebrate the Lord's goodness. Uh, it's nice to see uh, folks show the evidence of having been out in the sun these last few days. Uh, folks are looking red or tan, depending on how uh, life treats you on that, but uh, the Lord has been good. We've had a good couple of days of weather-wise and celebration of our graduates, uh, different places, and so uh, it's nice to be uh, here at this place. Would you pray with me, please, this morning? Father, we thank you uh, for your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come around it. Uh, thank you for your people uh, who have uh, set aside this time, Lord, whether they are here or at home, uh, that we might uh, just come and worship you. As we just sung a moment ago, you are worthy. And Father, we just ask that this morning all that is said and done would be done to your glory and to your honor, that your spirit would have freedom to work and to move amongst your people. Uh, Lord, that you would just uh, do the work that needs to be done here today. And we give you the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I trust as you came in, you grabbed a bulletin. There's a couple of things just to highlight for you to be aware of. Uh, Ladies Fellowship at OMA's is June 4th at 9 a.m., Saturday, 9 o'clock. Uh, so ladies plan for that. Uh, Mid-Rangers Dinner Out and Car Show in Detroit Lakes uh, is June 8th at 5 p.m. You do not need to have a car show car to go to that. Uh, but you will need to have one of those if you want to park down by the lake. Everyone else has to kind of park. So I uh, plan for that. I believe we're going to try to meet uh, here maybe in caravan if possible. Uh, so if you have questions on that, you can check the uh, bulletin for that or give me a call here at the church. And I am uh, taking uh, reservations if someone wants to drive my Fiero to the car show. If you've never seen a Pontiac Fiero, you'll know why that should have been funnier. Uh, <laughs> But you can see me about that later. Alliance Women's Salad Supper is June 9th at 6 p.m. So ladies, be aware of that and plan accordingly again June 9th at 6 p.m. With that, uh, we are going to watch now our Memorial Day video. When I look back through history, and consider all the sacrifices in every war. And I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, 
stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves. I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country. I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom. One airman who knew the cost and went anyway. One man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many. And the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Would you please stand and join us as we continue? This morning, I have a note here from Jean and Linda White. Uh, Dear church family, we want to thank those who kept us in mind and those who prayed for us. Thank you for those who came and helped pack and carry. There was a lot. To those who helped even before our move, thank you. You have all been a blessing to us far beyond what you will ever know. Jean and Linda White. Number of prayer requests this morning. Continue to pray for Brad Steiner. He had surgery on Thursday. The surgery went well, but he's got four to six weeks of recovery from that, so keep him in prayer. Continue to pray for Dave Fuller's sister, Melanie O'Keefe, who's battling cancer. Also continue to pray for Carla Johnson. She's going to be having some more tests done this week up in Fargo, and then uh, decide what to do regarding surgery for her. 
Uh, it's good to see Mary Jo Balls here this morning. Uh, as she progresses in her recovery from her broken leg, continue to pray for her. And then also, obviously, we want to pray for our country this morning as we uh, observe this Memorial Day weekend. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning so grateful for your amazing grace, grateful for your love, your goodness to us, the many blessings that you have poured out upon us. One of those blessings is living in a country where we enjoy freedoms, a country where we do not have to fear persecution. But Lord, we pray for our country. We pray that there would be a turning to you in this land. As we see the tragedies, like what happened this week down in Texas, it makes us aware of, of the tremendous needs in our land. And Father, I pray that people would turn back to you in faith, look to you for wisdom and guidance, and seek your face. I pray for us as followers of Jesus Christ that we would be a light, a witness, shining in this, in this country, in our communities, that we would be faithful to you and that we would remember to pray for our country. Lord, we are grateful for all those who have made the ultimate sacrifice in defending our freedoms. We remember them, and we give thanks for their service and their sacrifice, and we do not take that lightly. And I pray, Father, that we would not take our freedom for granted. Father, we lift up to you this morning also the prayer requests that have been mentioned. We pray for Brad as he continues to recover from his surgery. I pray that you would watch over him, heal him. And I pray that the surgery would be successful. And, Father, that he would uh, see the desired results from that surgery. Father, I pray for Melanie O'Keefe and lift her and the family up to you at this time and pray for strength and healing for your ministry to her life. I pray that you would just be very near to all of the family members at this time as well. We pray for Carla and ask for wisdom for the doctors caring for her. I pray that there would be clear direction, and that, Lord, she would be able to have this surgery and that it would be successful. We thank you that Mary Jo is here this morning. We pray for continued healing for her. Watch over her. Keep her safe. I pray that this leg would heal properly. Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for all those who serve in so many different ways, those who blessed Eugene and, and Linda this past week with, uh, and the weeks prior to that with all of the work that was done. Uh, Lord, people serve in so many ways that, that we're not even aware of, and, and we thank you for the willingness and the sacrifices that are made. Father, continue to work in our midst to accomplish what only you can do, uh, Lord, I pray that this church would be faithful to you and honor and glorify you through all of its various ministries. We pray now for a pastor as he comes uh, later in the service to bring the message that your hand would be upon him, that you would anoint him and speak through him, and Lord, that this service would lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand and join us? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father, praise the Son Praise the Spirit
Jesus, I can't help but remember those who have given their lives so that we could live a free life here. We want to take this time to just remember all of those who made that sacrifice, Lord. And this week, with the tragedy of all those kids lost, sometimes it's very easy to think why and for what purpose. But we know that we can trust in you. You are the ancient of days. We know that we can put our trust in you, knowing that you will use this for your honor and glory. God, bring people to you in light of this tragic loss, Lord. May those families who lost their children, may they know your love and comfort for the teachers and the staff in that building and the children, Lord. Use this in a powerful way for your kingdom glory to bring people to you, Lord. I just ask that as the service continues that you would be here in a powerful way, that our hearts would be prepared to hear what you have to show us. Reveal yourself to us this morning, Lord, and that message that you have to bring. I pray that you would speak through Pastor Tony, that you would use him as your vessel this morning, Lord. I ask all of these things in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time, children ages 3 through 6th grade are dismissed for Children's Church. We have one more prayer request this morning. We have a text that came in from Morgan Glenn's. As you're aware, Morgan is serving with Envision in the Atlanta area this summer. Uh, tomorrow, they begin a ministry in what is described as the most dangerous community in the United States. Uh, Brandon Hill is the name of it. Uh, lots of drugs, prostitution, gang violence, uh, etc. And they're going to be going door to door inviting kids to their vacation Bible school. And so she just asked us to remember this in prayer. So let's bow together. Father, we thank you today for Morgan, for her life, her willingness to serve. And Father, we want to pray this morning for a hedge of protection around her and the team going into this community. Lord, I pray that you would watch over them, that you would keep them safe, that, Father, you would open doors for them, give them opportunities for ministry. I pray that there would be those who would come to faith in Jesus Christ as a result of this ministry this week. We pray that you would give them favor, that you would produce the fruit that only you can produce through their lives and ministry. Morgan is also asking for clarity as she plans out her schedule and how she serves uh, you through this summer, I pray that you would guide and direct her steps every step of the way, that she would know your hand is upon her, working in her and through her to your praise and to your glory. We just lift this team up to you and pray again for your protection and for open doors for them in ministry. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you take your Bibles, please, and open to 2 Peter once again, 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 12 through 15 this morning, but we'll be finishing out chapter 1 in our examination this morning. So 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, reading through verse 15. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ had made clear to me. And I will also be diligent at any time after my departure that you will be able to call these things to mind. A recent uh, Barna study that I uh, watched a video discussion about uh, uh, is relating to the phenomenon that is going on in the church uh, where the younger generation is, is moving away from affiliation uh, with Christianity, with their faith, what they were brought up in. 
And one of the reasons, the rationale that was offered as uh, a cause of this taking place uh, was their view of the scriptures. Uh, the, the statement that the, the Bible, while revered, uh, had no real or practical bearing on their life. And so they, they had this, this drift, if you will, between what they were raised to believe and honoring that more as tradition than, than seeing it as something that carried them into adulthood. Uh, as we consider this last part of chapter 1 in Second Peter, uh, we want to be mindful again that we are, uh, as Peter lays out for us, laying the groundwork for how it is that the church, the believers, can stand against the false teaching that is coming in. How can the believer prepare themselves uh, to stand firm, even in, in the first century church, as we do today, against those that would come in and pervert and twist and change the gospel, change the word of God for their own purposes? He began, as we saw before, by reminding us of what we need to know about our salvation, that we are saved by grace through faith, that it is, uh, it is uh, the means and result of our salvation are rooted in Christ. When we were last together, we examined then uh, what it is that we were meant to do in response to this, that we as believers are meant to grow, that the, the Christian faith is not a call to a static ideal, but rather it is a dynamic and living relationship that, that produces in us, that produces out of that life, the virtues that Peter outlines for us in that verses 5 through 7 before telling us the benefits to you and I of spiritual growth. He has one last area to turn our attention to before he identifies the characteristics of the false teachers, and that area has to do uh, with the results of that Barna study, oddly enough. It has to do with how the church views and holds the Word of God. What is our perception of the Scriptures? What do we need to know about the Bible that would help us or would matter to us in very practical ways as we face false teaching specifically, but other issues as well. You've undoubtedly driven around uh, the community and, and seen the damage still from the past uh, the storms a couple of weeks ago. I've heard more comments from folks as it relates to the way the pine trees all went down. Uh, if you drive uh, down the road and, and, and look, you'll find that they are, they are just tipped over. And the ground just kind of peeled up underneath him. I was impressed. I had Andrew come over. Uh, I don't know if he volunteered or was coerced, but Andrew came over nonetheless over a couple of days, and, and we helped clean up not only around my place in Pastor Heath, but also one of our neighbors. And what was interesting to me is, as I watched him work uh, was these trees were, were tall, robust, full trees. The one particularly that I, I miss is the one in front of our house, uh, which was a good-looking pine tree. Everything about it looked right. It was uniform. It was, it was full on all sides. It wasn't hemmed in by other trees, so it wasn't getting all scraggly at the bottom. It was a beautiful tree. And yet when that tree fell down, uh, it, it, it appeared as though it had just been taken from somewhere and just sort of set there, the way you might set a vase of flowers on the counter. Because it just tipped over so easily. And in fact, when Andrew was done with his machine grabbing and pulling and tugging on all the stumps and all the roots, and then just sort of back dragging over it for a moment, all that was left was just a dirt spot in the yard. There was, there was barely even a hole where the tree had been. And that was kind of surprising to me. I, I wasn't aware, uh, you know, normally you see a stump come out of the ground and there's a big hole that needs to be filled. But these trees just, just tipped over as if they had just been placed there. And it was striking because, as I said before, they seemed so strong and vibrant before the winds came and blew. But the problem is, and you're aware of this, of course, is that although they were beautiful, healthy trees outwardly, the reality is that their surface was all there was. There was nothing really much below the sod line for that type of tree. They were very shallow in their life. An illustration of that stands out to us, I believe, as we consider the spiritual condition of the church. 
as we consider the spiritual health, our spiritual lives, there can be the same type of dynamic. We can, we can have what looks to be, outwardly, a very healthy, growing, vibrant, spiritual life. We can, we can say all the right things. We can sing all the right songs. We can, we can look the part. And then the winds of life kind of blow across from time to time. And I think just as startling, if not more so, is when we see those giant, tall pines of the Christian world just sort of laying on their sides, and we realize there wasn't a whole lot of depth there. I realize that we live in a time where uh, our culture celebrates uh, dramatic failure. We, we celebrate, and when I say celebrate, I don't mean necessarily that we enjoy it, but we certainly give it a lot of our air time, don't we? conversations, even within the church, the printed page, the internet, when, when someone who is viewed as colossal in any particular discipline falls, we, we are drawn to that. It's, it's almost some kind of a, a psychosis, I don't know. We can't look away. And we can sometimes fall into the trap of, of, of sort of enumerating all of the reasons that we saw that coming from a mile. Oh, I knew that guy was setting himself up. I could tell. The reality is, if we step back, those moments are shocking and startling. And for me in particular, I don't know, maybe for you, those moments cause me a great deal of pause. I can remember when I was uh, growing up in our church in Pennsylvania, we had a minister uh, who fell into moral failure. And uh, it was devastating to the church. In fact, when it was, the dust all settled, there were, there were three adult members left in the church, my dad being one of them. And I can remember thinking, boy, this is, this is insane how quickly things can go so badly. And I remember listening to the chatter as things were unfolding of some of the adults in the conversation. I was, I was about uh, 14 years old, I suppose, at that time. And there was the same kind of chatter I just alluded to. There was those that said, oh, I knew it. I could tell the last six months, boy, his sermons were just fluff and garbage. And then I would hear someone else, oh, you know, I, I'm, I was shocked. I never saw this coming. Their sermons were so, so deep and profound. Right? You see, folks, when, when, when the apparent health and strength of something is revealed to be so easily tipped over. It's not an opportunity for us to revel and celebrate in the failure of someone else, and it's not an opportunity for us to, to, to cower back in shock and paralyzed fear. It's an opportunity for us to recognize that we need to understand why that happens. And this morning, we're not going to unpack all of the whys of that broader topic, but I call your attention to it because I want you to understand that at the core of this, at, at the heart of this, is the issue that Peter wants to bring up. It's the issue that is revealed in that Barna study. It's the reality that the people of God have to have an established understanding of the Word of God. And, and to put it in another way, uh, the title of the sermon, we have to have a high view of Scripture. For far too many churches, far too many believers, far too many pastors... The scriptures have become ancillary to the whole project and program of church. In fact, if I had the time this morning and you had the inclination to listen to me tell you, I would say that we need to talk about the reality that our view of scripture is far too limited and low, and as a result, our view of prayer is far too limited and low, and as a result, our view of our God is far too limited and low. And I read the articles and I try to keep up on all the latest uh, academic chatter on these things and I can tell you that by and large, I fear that we are totally missing the target. We're not, we're not short a program. We're not short the silver bullet methodology or style of church. It wouldn't matter if you change the architecture of the buildings. It wouldn't matter if you change the way the chairs are arranged. It doesn't matter if you're meeting in a living room or a large auditorium. It doesn't matter if you sing contemporary music or traditional music. It doesn't matter if the women sit on one side and the men sit on another. It doesn't matter if you dress up or dress down. It doesn't matter the lingo or the language that you decide to use to describe the church that you belong to. What matters is how do we view the Scripture 
And how do we engage with a living God in a living relationship as a result of that? And Peter wants to draw our attention to this danger, this reality, because if we do not get this right, we are in trouble. It would be a huge mistake to take the first four verses of this letter and say, okay, this is great. We acknowledge that we have all of these resources in Christ. And then to move on from that as we did and say, okay, I'm also going to diligently pursue the qualities and characteristics he describes here. And then get all the way down here to the end of this chapter and say, but I'm going to do all of that separated off from the power of the scriptures. And you've heard me talk about this before. There is, a, there is a very real danger in modern Christendom where we have this idea that the Bible is just the best of many self-help books. That, that if, if, you, if you just sort of flip through the pages and find all the places and memorize all the one another passages and, 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 and look at all these lists of characteristics and qualities... And then make yourself the list of all the stuff to be avoided. And just do your due best to kind of stay on one list and not the other. That that's the value of scripture. When the reality is, this is the living word of God. And if we are, to Peter's point, to stand against and refute false teaching, we need to do so with a right high view of scripture. Let me quote for you Dr. Jack Arnold. If you don't know who he is, he, he is more famous for how he died than, than anything else, although how he lived is certainly worthy in, in many regards of, of following. He, Dr. Jack Arnold died in the pulpit. The last words he uttered from the, from the pulpit were, when I get to heaven, and then he had a massive heart attack and dropped dead right there on the stage. What a way to go. Right? Boots on, on the job. When I get to heaven, and then he was there. But he said the following. He contended that the greatest battle within the church is the battle over the Bible. The greatest battle in the church. Now listen to what he said for a moment. The greatest battle in the church is the battle over the Bible. If I were to ask you this morning, and I won't, but if I were to ask you by show of hands, how many of you would have thought that phrase would be better stated, the greatest battle outside of the church is the battle over the Bible? You would have, many of you would raise your hand because we live in such a time and a culture where we rightly, to some degree, recognize that one of the differentiations between those who know Christ and those who don't is our stated allegiance to the Word of God, to the bearing that the Word of God is supposed to have on our lives. If it were automatic that that were to happen, Peter would not have had to write what he's written here, as well as Paul and a number, another number of other Bible authors have had a touch on this point, and we wouldn't see some of the problems we see. I think Dr. Arnold is on to something when he says that the greatest problem in the church, the greatest battle in the walls, has to do with the battle for the Bible. And that should not surprise us, because if you go all the way back to the garden, what was the enemy's tactic? He came and attacked to Adam and to Eve. He attacked the word of God. The spoken law. The, the, God had said to man, this is what is expected. And the devil came and said, are you sure? And so it should not surprise us that all of these centuries later, in our enlightened and modern and polished church, that the enemy has not had to change his tactics. He simply has to come along to God's people and say, are you sure? And what's better yet than that now is he doesn't even have to ask us if, he's sure, if we're sure because he can just come along and say, hey, don't worry about that at all, and we agree with him. Now, I'm not trying to be overly critical here. I'm painting with a broad brush, and I'm not trying to, to speak to anything in specific, but the reality is that the, the, the by and large, the average Christian today, the, the, the largest unbroken period of time they spend in the Word of God in a seven-day period is when their preacher's up here talking about it. And then they just go home. And if you'll allow me one moment to digress. This is a thus saith Tony, not a thus saith the Lord thing. You're going to probably be upset. Can I just make a case for old fashioned for a second? Can I do that? I shouldn't. I shouldn't. You got, you got me, Dan? Okay. Talk to me afterwards for all of the exceptions to what I'm about to say. Buy yourself one of these. Buy yourself a paper copy of the Bible. 
with all due respect to smartphones and tablets. And I know that's just, I understand it's just the English language printed on a page, and it's all, I understand it. But ladies and gentlemen, understand. Can I, this is all opinion. I shouldn't say this on Sundays. This isn't cluttered up with a bunch of other junk. I, don't, I can't take this and flip to solitaire. <laughs> I, don't, I don't come here and search the latest fashion trends in Europe and then see what God has to say. This is, this is just his word to me. Amen. And so, it is, and it's, not, it's not magic, and it's not saying that if you flip on your phone, you're not reading the same thing. I understand the NASB that I read is I can find it on my phone. I get that. But what I'm saying is, there's, there, and maybe it's just for me because I, I'm, I'm simple-minded, there is something symbolically sacred about not abandoning the simplicity of just the scriptures and the ability to, maybe I'm just a bibliophile, I just like the smell of the pages. I like the feel of the thin parchment. I like how, I like how it takes me back when I flip to a section and I see a highlighting from five, six, seven, eight, ten years ago, and I, oh, I remember when I highlighted that because the Lord was speaking to me about, and there's just something about it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly critical of technology. What I'm trying to say is this, folks, that there are, there, are, there are so many subtle ways that our inherent low view of Scripture shows up in our life that it's no wonder to me that we don't spend any time with it. It's no wonder to me that we don't know where to find stuff in it. It's unacceptable for the people of God to simply dismiss as the, the realm of scholarship a basic working, functioning, understanding, and familiarity with the Word of God. It is absolutely, in the eyes of our Savior, unacceptable. And so let's see what Peter has to say. None of that was supposed to be the sermon today. I apologize. I wanted to say to you uh, why it is that we should hold the Scriptures in such high regard, the value that it has to us. So let's look at what we're supposed to talk about. Verses 12 through 15, first of all, it is enduring. If you like to take notes, this is where your bulletins pick up. The word of God is enduring. Peter uses in these opening few verses of our section his impending death as a backdrop. He is by now in his late 60s, perhaps early 70s. He's likely in a Roman jail. Church tradition and, and history, as best that we can put it together, tells us that shortly after penning this letter, he would be crucified upside down. He's writing, uh, some commentators refer to this portion of his letter or the letter as a whole uh, as his last will and testament. He's got one last chance to say some things to the people he loves. He's got one last chance to speak on this side of glory for the Savior that he loves. And he wants to make sure they understand some things. And so he wants them to first of all understand that the word of God is, is an enduring word. What makes it so enduring? First of all, verse 12, it is always necessary. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you, he says, of these things. Philippians 3, 1, Paul says something very similar. He said, for me, it is not grievous to repeat this, but for you, it is necessary. There, there should not be within the church an attitude that says, oh, I've heard that already. One of the things I struggled with in my early ministry, I'll be quite honest with you, uh, was, uh, was, figuring, was thinking, Lord, I don't know how somebody can do this for an entire lifetime uh, because eventually you're going to have to go back to somewhere you've already been. And so I set out on sort of this self-proclaimed mission where I would not preach the same book of the Bible a second time until I preached all the other ones. I haven't gotten through the entire Bible yet. And I can say with some, some confidence that I have not repeated a whole lot either. But we should not be, as the people of God, one of those that say, well, you know, I don't, if, if the preacher's only going to be speaking on, on John 3.16, I don't need to go to that service because I've known that verse my whole life. See, what the scripture says of itself is that it is always necessary. Not only because of its divine nature, but also because of our mortality. I won't ask for a show of hands again, although I think I would get a few. Husbands, how many of you have ever had your wife repeat something to you that she claims to have already said? There's a hand there. There's one honest man in the whole crowd. 
I routinely have conversations for the second and third time with my wife that I think I'm having for the first time. Because we are forgetful. We can hear something, we can read something, we can be told something, we can anticipate something, we can be invested in something, and then something else distracts us for a moment, and we've lost whatever it is that we thought we were chasing. And so the Word of God is always necessary. It is not, he says here something, he said, I'm always ready. I will always be ready to remind you of these things. The flip side of that, ladies and gentlemen, is you and I should always be ready to be reminded. We should always be in a posture that says, if the word of the Lord is being opened, there's something there for me. It is one of the great heartaches of the modern church when people will leave church and they'll utter, I didn't get anything out of that. So you wasted a whole hour of your weekend. Really? No, I'm not advocating for giving preachers props. I'm just telling you, if you left your house this morning and you got in your car, and you took the time to drive over here, get the kids all dressed and ready, go through all the hassle and struggle, and believe me, I know, I remember the hassle and struggle of getting yourselves to church, and then you've sat here already for the first 40 minutes or so of this, and you're hoping that the next 20 are all that's left, and you get up out of your chair, and you go to your car, and you say to one another, well, we didn't get anything out of that. Can I just offer to you for a moment that maybe the problem's in your car? And not in your pew. See, folks, we need to have an attitude. We need to have a mindset that says, I am always ready to be reminded of whatever the Lord wants to bring to my mind. Isn't that why we love the Holy Spirit as we do? Don't we anticipate that as he promises, where two or more are gathered together, I am there in their midst also? Don't we anticipate? I pray and trust, folks, hear me on this. When you leave your house on Sunday morning, I pray and trust that you're driving here because you, you believe to your core the Spirit of God is here. Now, he's not confined to these walls. He's not, he's not trapped in our church, but he sure delights in the gathering of his church. Come expectant. Peter says, I've, I'm, I'm always ready. It's always. Now, secondly, it's timeless, verses 13 to 15. The word of God is timeless. Peter looks to the past, and he recalls when the Lord said to him, you're going you're to go somewhere when you're older, and it's not going to be where you want to go. In fact, he said, Jesus told Peter, this is how you're going to die. And Peter looks to the past, and he remembers that. And then he looks to the present, and he says, hey, that time's upon me. It's coming now. And then he looks to the future, and he says, and I want to make sure that when I'm gone, the truth that you have been told outlives me. The Word of God is timeless. It's never stale. It's never outdated. It is not rendered obsolete by changes in our culture. It is not rendered obsolete by changes in the morals or mores of our society. It can't be outlawed. It can't be relawed. It is the Word of God. It is timeless for all of time. It speaks fresh and new to every single generation of humanity. We need to, we need to reclaim the living place of Scripture in the church today. We need, to, we need to reach back and pull it out of the bygone era that we have mentally sent it to, and we need to bring it back to the forefront. And Peter's saying to us, listen, I have one last chance to tell you something, and what I want to tell you is this. I want to tell you that what I say has to live past me. It's one of the reasons that... Uh, I really like some of the, what to me, are the older commentators of the scriptures. I like the, 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 the Epps and the Wearsbys of the world. I like the guys that recognize that their job was not to find some new creative spin on the Bible, but their, God was to, their goal was to faithfully take what had been taught as truth and, and just encapsulate it and articulate it afresh in a new generation. And I'm grateful for those today that do the same. Please don't misunderstand me. It's just harder to navigate through all of the other things for me today. The Word of God is timeless. Not the slightest little mark, jot, or tittle will, will fade away until all is completed. But not only is the Word of God enduring, it is also to be highly regarded because it is established truth Verses 16 to 21. First of all, we want to notice it is rooted in apostolic witness. 
So Peter's dealing with some folks that are saying in general, hey, the, the apostles, this guy Peter, Paul, these other guys, they're, they're just making up stories. They're making up fables. They're just trying to draw a crowd. They're not giving you the straight deal on this stuff. And so he wants us to understand that the scriptures are established truth. He says, first of all, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It is rooted in apostolic witness. The false teachers held a very low view of the Bible. They thought that adding to it would be more uh, appropriate for the times then. They denied uh, the teachings of the return of Christ. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, we see him address this. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mockings. So Peter is dealing with and getting the church to deal with people that denied the very basic tenets of the faith as revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. But more than that, Peter also affirms the truth of not only the Old Testament, but also the New Testament scriptures. Look at the beginning of chapter 3. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of this reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord our Savior spoken by your apostles. So you see the testimony of scripture is that the Old Testament and the New Testament are all the inspired word of God spoken and given to the church. And he says, as a result of this, it is an established truth rooted first in apostolic witness. Secondly, then, it is also rooted in apostolic experience. Because now Peter wants to say, here, here's what you didn't get to see, false teachers. Here's what we witnessed that is real powerful that you need to understand. And he talks to them about something really interesting. He brings up what is referred to in scriptures as the transfiguration. He says, verse 17, For when he received honor, he being Christ, and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. You can read in the Gospels the account of the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John joined Jesus up on the mount, and, and, and Moses and Elijah and the glory of God come down, and Jesus is transfigured before them. And it says in the scriptures that his face shone like the sun, and his raiment was white. It's a fulfillment of the promise that Christ made to his disciples when he said, some of you will see in your life the re revelation of the glory of the Son of God. And those three saw. And in fact, Peter asked, this is, he says, this is good that we should be here. Let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It was a life-altering experience that they saw. And the transfiguration and Peter's use of it here points to the second coming of Christ and to the millennial kingdom to come. And so the testimony of the scriptures as established truth are rooted first in apostolic witness, secondly in apostolic experience. But those two together would be insufficient to make a claim that the scriptures are established truth. And so Peter gives us the greatest evidence of all in verses 19 to 21 when he says that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. First, let's deal with verse 19 for a moment. There is some uh, difference of opinion as to what the emphasis of this verse ought to be among theological scholars. Some take this verse to point to the supremacy of Scripture over experience. In other words, they say, in essence, that the Scripture is more sure than the experience that you might have. Guys that hold this position would be John MacArthur, Warren Wearsby, and others. The Greek language would defend, I think, that position as a point of emphasis. But some emphasize that this verse points also to the reality of faith becoming sight. That the experience that Peter had on the mountain confirmed for him the validity of the Old Testament Scriptures that spoke of Christ. And so there's, if you ever want to have fun, you can sit down over tea or coffee and you can debate these finer points of scriptural interpretation. I personally am of the opinion that you can find a valid point in both of those and they do not need to necessarily be mutually exclusive. 
I think that you can make the case, not just from this passage, but from others, that we need to be careful with elevating experience too high in our lexicon of evidence. That experiences need to be tried, tested, and proven in accordance to the scriptures, which would, by their very virtue, make the scriptures supreme to our experiences. And we have seen throughout church history the damage that can be done when we neglect the reality of the relationship between the scriptures and our experiences. Experiences can be fabricated. Experiences can be misunderstood and misapplied. And a lot of danger can come out of that. A lot of poorly applied truth can be mired in that. And yet I think we also can recognize in our own lives and bear testimony to the fact that our experiences that we've had of God's faithfulness have confirmed and deeply rooted the truth of Scripture in our hearts, haven't they? You see, one of the, one of the beauties of, of true faith, one of the beauties of Christianity as a relationship with the living Savior is that we don't simply come to the Scriptures as theoretically written words. In other words, when the Scriptures say that we need not worry about anything, but we can turn to Him in prayer. Do we believe that? Do we believe that we can simply go to Him in prayer? Or do we just wring our hands and worry all the more? When the Scriptures talk to us of His abiding presence in the shadow of the valley of death, and then He talks to us about, about His comfort in loss, is that real to us? For the believer it can be. It ought to be. And so this isn't just theoretical knowledge. This is real, vibrant, living knowledge. And so as a result, I think you can make a case for both positions on this particular verse. But regardless of which aspect of this verse you think the emphasis belongs on, the unified and, and, and final truth that Peter wants us to understand is this. The Bible can be trusted because it is the final authoritative word of God. There's a difference between uncertainty and doubt and skepticism when it comes to the scriptures. It is absolutely reasonable for finite, limited people like you and I to come to such a vast, deep, and profound work as the scriptures and find ourselves at times uncertain as to what it might mean and how we might apply it. It is even reasonable, I think, because we are finite creatures on this side of glory to endure situations and circumstances of such a profound nature that we find ourselves, even if just for the moment, questioning, wondering, doubting whether or not we've really understood what the Lord would have for us in that. That is vastly different than coming to this book and saying, well, I'm going to take the posture that none of it's true, and I'm going to see if it can't prove itself. It's different than being a skeptic of the Word of God. And Peter is saying to us, listen, the Word of God is established truth. The parts you understand are established truth. The parts you don't understand are established truth. The parts that are applied to your situation in the moment are. The parts that you don't think are. And so he says to us, this word, this, this, this word that we have is trustworthy. It is authoritative. And so then he says, as such, we ought to pay attention to it. So he says, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The psalmist, referring to the word of God, says it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I heard an evangelist one time preach on that passage, and I loved it. He said, a, light, a lamp to your feet tells you what the next step is. It doesn't shine beyond that step. A lamp unto your path illuminates where it is you're going. And doesn't the word of God do both of those things for us? And he says here, there's a, there's a trick to that, though. There's a key to that. He says, pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. If you, anyone ever comes to me, over the years in ministry, people have, surprisingly, come to me for, with questions, and, uh, and they're struggling with a decision that needs to be made, the first question I always ask them, and it's not meant to be trite, it's not meant to be dismissive, the first question I always ask is, how's your, how's your devotional life? How's your time in the Word? What's your prayer life? Talk to me about how your prayer life is going. What, what's, what's your posture towards the fellowship of the saints? Are, are you communing with, with other believers on a regular enough basis that they can inform your life and you can inform theirs? Those three questions, you've heard me talk about this before. And I'm always, I'm always a bit saddened when, when, when it, it, the expected answer, well, not very good, not very good, not very good, 
but we've reached a place now, even within the church, I'll be honest with you, sometimes the answer is not very good and it doesn't need to be, not very good and it doesn't need to be, not very good and it doesn't need to be. Pastor, I want the fourth answer. I want the magic answer. I want the answer you keep in the bottom drawer locked up. There isn't any answer in there. See, folks, if the word of God is to be powerful in our lives, we need to heed the word of Peter when he says to us, we would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. When our time in the word is scant, when our need for prayer is non-existent, when our fellowship with the body of Christ is sporadic, you will not have clarity in the questions of life. I guarantee you that. And there is not another answer to replace what you have neglected. It doesn't exist. How long do we have to concern ourselves with this? He tells us. He says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What is he referring to there? The day dawns is the second coming. Christ is referred to as the morning star. So folks, there's coming a day when all of the word will be fulfilled in perfection. And not only fulfilled, but we will actually understand it all. All of the questions that need answers will get an answer. And all of the questions that don't get answers weren't necessary questions anyway. And we will see him and we will be like him. And we will be in his presence and there will be no need for sun or moon or stars because he will be our light. And on that day, when that comes, then, then we will understand and know in its fullness. He then gets to the point we made this morning that it is not human will, but it is God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration. It is God breathed, it is profitable, it is necessary. And so the word is established truth, established in the witness and experience of the apostles. And more so and greater than that, it is established because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you'll allow me just one more quote for you from Jack Arnold. He said this, It is not enough to merely possess the Bible. We need to be subject to it. It's not enough to simply possess the Bible. We need to be subject to it to it. That's the, the link, the key to that Barna study I referenced. It, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night. I have four kids. Our church is blessed to have teens and kids coming up through the ranks. And I wrestle and struggle and grieve over the question, Lord, how do we, how do we not make this our faith that they play act in until they're out of our house? How, how, do we, how do we get them to see that the Word of God needs to possess them? It's, it's, it's a question that, that sits on the precipice of, of, of a dual crisis in the church today. There's the internal crisis of, of, a, of a divorced view of the Scripture, that the Scriptures don't really have an impact, that they don't really have this, this vital living reality that Peter talks about. There's, the, there's this internal crisis that's, that, that, that impacts a church that becomes marked by sinfulness and division that is powerless in her testimony. It results in what Paul describes in Ephesians as being blown about by every wind of doctrine and change by the trickery of men. A low view of Scripture reduces churches to social clubs and weekly gatherings of, of people to discuss social, cultural problems and questions without any real bearings. But there's, an, there's a secondary crisis, and that's the external crisis that arises outside of the church that has a low view of Scripture. And when a church that has a low view of Scripture on their website lists their doctrinal statement and maybe on their signage around the church, they talk about their high view of Scripture, and yet they live out their life as if that's not true. It destroys the witness of the church. And let us never forget the church does not witness as an end unto itself. It's not about church growth in counting noses. It's not about convincing people on the outside to be adhered to a certain set of standards and rules and expectations. It's about the reality that people without Jesus Christ will die and go to a Christless eternity in a real place called hell. And when a church has a low view of Scripture... A church has almost no view of evangelism and missiology. 
Our aim and our mark become simply trying to collect more people that look like me and sound like me and agree with me and just sort of stuff them into chairs once a week. But when we have a high view of Scripture, when we remember that the Word of God is enduring, it is always necessary. When, when, we, when we remember that the Word of God is established, absolute, singular truth in a world that has no concept of that, then... Then we're on to something. Then as the people of God, we are in a position where we can address these dual crises and we can say, not in the camp. We're not going to allow the things that are forbidden by our Savior to take root and flourish among us. And we're not going to allow our witness to be silenced by our own rejection of our own truth. But we'll be mobilized, motivated, driven, if you will. There's, by the way, I'll use a word that's unpopular today. You read the Gospels. You read the book of Acts. And if you're so inclined, you can get your hands on some of the church histories and some of the, some of the non-biblical but yet still accurate pictures of what was going on. And what you would find out is the people that walked with Jesus were fanatical followers of Jesus. And that's the word nobody likes today because it means all these horrible things. But ladies and gentlemen, let's not reject that word and replace it with apathetic. Let's not reject that word and replace it with comfortable. Let's not reject that word and replace it with, with just simply trying to make sure that my religious side of my life is spit and shined enough that nobody would think there's anything going on. We need to have a high view of Scripture. We need to be consumed by its truth. We need to be subject to it. If we want to make a difference, if we want the world to know, if we want our churches to be what our churches are supposed to be, then the people who populate our churches have to be the people that God calls them to be in his word. And so my encouragement to you is this, and, and this is, I hesitate on this because it's, it, 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 it creates all kinds of other questions perhaps, because I don't want to call you simply to a habit but I do need to call you to something. There's an action that has to be taking place here. And so I'll just say this. Do an honest assessment of your attitude towards the Scripture. Start with your attitude towards the Scripture. Ask yourself some basic questions. Does the Bible have a real-world impact on how I make my decisions? If you're not sure how to answer that, then put it in the, in the softer form. Should the Bible have a direct impact on how I make my decisions, how I live my life, the things I do. As a Christian, ask yourself, should it? Maybe you think it shouldn't. I'd encourage you to take me to lunch. We'll talk about that. Ask yourself. And then when you've, when you've answered the question, should the Bible have a direct impact on how I live my life? Is the Bible all the things and more than what Pastor Tony said this morning? When you've answered that question, then you can do your own assessment and you can simply ask yourself this. How much time then do I spend in this book that's supposed to have such an impact on my life? Time's not the only measurement, I understand that. But it's a pretty assess accessible measurement, isn't it? We can, we can all access the measurement of time. And I'm not saying how many minutes a day, how many hours a day do you do it in the morning. There's plenty of books written about things that people tell you that's the best way to do it. I'm not, I'm not trying to give you a methodology to adopt. I'm trying to give you an attitude to foster in your heart. If the only time you see the Bible is on Sunday morning here, make a decision that you're going to see it one other day a week. Whatever it is for you, I don't know what it is. But I know that the truth of the matter is if we're going to understand what Peter's going to call us to next, we have to have a high view of this word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Lord, more could be said. Your word is readily available to us and is unsearchable at the same time. Help us. Help us first and foremost, Lord, not to, not to adopt a habit, not to leave here feeling bad because we don't do enough and try to just do better. But Lord, help us to, to have a heart awakened to the place that your word should hold in our lives. And out of that awakening, Father, then call us 
Call us specifically, uniquely to how it is that you would have each of us individually and corporately come to your word. That we might be transformed by it. That we might then go out into a world that desperately needs to hear. Thank you, Father, for the ministry of your spirit. Thank you for your gentleness, your patience towards us in our folly. Lord, may all things be done to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. As the singers come, we close our service. If you're looking for a specific reading assignment, read Psalm 119. Set aside some time and hear what the word says of itself. Let's sing together.